Here's a special important message. Hello, welcome to season two, episode 11 of We Are The Road Crew podcast. My name is Stephen Hill. I'm your host for the show. This is, of course, if you've been listening throughout our episodes, you'll know by now that this is the podcast that takes you behind the scenes and speaks to some of the people who help make your favourite gigs in the world of live music happen. Uh, We have a great guest for you this week. His name is John Burton. But before I talk to you about John and give you a little preamble about his quite frankly fascinating career i just want to say a very very big thank you to our good friends who are supporting us on this season of the podcast at signature brew um signature brew as i'm sure you will be aware if you frequent live music venues and and pay attention to bands extracurricular activities are a fantastic brewing company who have been supporting live music and various bands bands such as idols slaves mogwai mastodon enter shikari brewing beers for those guys since 2011 they um they they, they do some fantastic alcoholic beverages for your um, your drinking purposes. Sorry, I lost the plot a little bit there, almost as if I'd been drinking them. Well, funnily, you should say that, because uh, I actually did... I did have a studio lager earlier, actually, with my dinner, which is a kind of staple of bars and venues around the country. It's uh, actually been found in their iconic recording studios, such as Metropolis and uh, Strong Room in Leech, London, which is where the Signature Brew was conceived. And very nice it is, too. It's got a kind of uh, crisp, clean flavour with a bit of a floral finish. I've never used to be much of a connoisseur of beers, but I want to say thanks to the guys at Signature Brew for sending their um, wares over to us. And I feel like I'm getting a much a much better palate. So get over to Signature signaturebrew.co.uk and um, put the code roadcrew in the uh, in the checkout and you'll get 10% off all of their beers so big thanks to them let's move on to this week's guest which as I mentioned at the start of the show is John Burton John is a live sound engineer for the Prodigy now um, obviously the Prodigy are one of the greatest live bands in the history of music I would say and John has been working with them for for many years he's seen um All of the incredible shows that the Prodigy have done over the last 15 years or so, uh, John has been a part of. And I'm really, really looking forward to delving into what it was like being part of the mechanics of that band. Because growing up in the 90s, as as I did, and I think as I've mentioned a bunch of times on the podcast, the Prodigy were just one of the most awe-inspiring live spectacles. And they remained one of the most awe-inspiring live spectacles up until the very, very sad, very tragic and untimely passing of Keith Flint uh, last year, which hit a lot of us very, very hard. So obviously we're going to kind of tiptoe around that a little bit, but I do want to speak to John about some of the great memories I had with Keith and some of the great memories of seeing that band. Um, John um, actually came up in the, the kind of the very fertile oxford music scene of the kind of mid 80s to the early 90s where loads of great bands were playing back then so i'm going to chat to him about that he's worked with an incredible cast of people but obviously particularly we want to speak to john about doing the live sound for one of the great bands in the history of live music which is the prodigy so enough of my rambling and my um slightly inebriated preamble let's get down to it now this is me talking to john burton all right, John Burton joins me from what you're lo- what I can see from behind you is a massive mixing desk. <clears throat> yeah, I'm pretending to be in my studio, um, which is in Sheffield. Uh, so this this is my 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 sort of small mix room, which I've I, I'm currently locked out of because uh, I rented it out just before Christmas, thinking I'm not going to get a chance to get in there. So I rented it out to a couple of brothers who are busy working away. And I'm having to rent off my studio off them to if I need to do anything at the moment. Except obviously we're locked out. So, so yeah, I've got all this spare time and a massive studio that I'm not going to get a chance to use, which is quite ironic, really. But yeah, I was going to say, like, like we have been saying to to everyone who's been coming on the show, how's it been during the kind of lockdown um, for you? Like, how has that affected? I mean, obviously it's affected your working environment quite a lot. Well, um, not so much as many of my colleagues, really, because I st- actually stopped touring. Um, last summer and i mean i don't know if anyone anyone knows my career but uh i worked for the prodigy for 15 years and when keith sadly passed away last march i just thought I've, i'm never going to find another band i'm never going to get another band of that stature um so i'll go and get a proper job so uh i hunted around and i ended up getting a job in derby at the university so i'm currently teaching so uh 
all my gigs have been cancelled. I had a fantastic summer arranged. Uh, I actually managed to pick up a couple of really good bands and I had a really nice summer arrangement, which is obviously all gone out the window. But I'm busy uh, teaching, supporting students, doing exams this week. Uh, so I'm busier than I've ever been. Wow. You're a, you're a key worker as well, John, now. You're officially I believe so, a key yeah. worker. We should be clapping for you. Oh, I don't think so, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get into um, to what's happening right now a little bit later on. But, um, you know, as we usually start off the podcast, we tend to talk about what it is that first got people into music and started them on that journey, um, particularly live music. Do you remember the first gig that you ever went to and, and how that made you feel? Um I th- the first gig was when I was a kid, but the first one I actually bought a ticket to and went to myself was Thin Lizzy, which was uh, at Oxford oh, wow. New Theatre, and it was the Johnny the Fox tour, and I, I was just gobsmacked. I just thought it was brilliant. <laughs> and mm. that kind of started it all, really. And I kind of used to go to – and this was probably about – I was probably about 14 or 15, but I lived in a village, so it was quite hard. The last bus into town was five past two in the afternoon. Last bus home was <laughs> ten past six. It was a bit restricting. Yeah. So, but I, I used to try and go to gigs in Oxford as often as possible, but that kind of spurred me on, really. I, I, yeah, I mean, I loved gigs. The first time I saw a big band, I was like, this is brilliant. And Thin Lizzy, what a great place to start. Yeah, amazing. What a great band. What era, what lineup was that? I'm trying to That's, think what, what um, year and what era that would be. That would be Brian Robertson on guitar. So that was 1975 right. or 76. I'm quite old, you see. So, uh, yeah, a long time ago, <laughs> long time ago like a fantastic way to start i mean actually that's i think i don't know if you've ever seen inside out the documentary about creation records but bobby gillespie and uh, alan mcgee the first gig they ever went to together was thin lizzie so you know as a first gig probably around the same time actually because i think mcgee's about my age <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> pretty pretty good company so after that kind of initial burst of excitement seeing thin lizzie um you mentioned kind of going to gigs around the oxford area i mean obviously this would have been a many many years later but oxford became a very very creative and exciting place for music yeah i mean it um, was for quite a while that time i mean i you have to go back a long way but i was i went to school in a, in a village called kidlington right and uh kidlington had a, a band called mr big not the american mr big but the british mr big who had a, a, a top 10 single so we had a big band in the village you know uh and there were always bands around Oxford. It's always had a really good musical sort of vibe to it. Uh, obviously, I worked for a lot of the, the bands that came out of Oxford and played in bands in Oxford as well. So, uh, yeah, I kind of did my rounds with Oxford. I mean, that's kind of where I started off with creation bands like Ride. Right, uh, yeah. I worked for them for six years, I think. And obviously, How did that come about? Um, Just sort of hanging around? No, I mean, uh, just hanging around, yeah. <laughs> we used to, well, I, the first time I saw them was actually, uh, we used to do a thing called Fun in the Parks, which was a council run thing, which where I was working for a local PA company and we used to set up a stage in a little marquee and it was just free in one of the parks. And then we went around the parks each Saturday in the summer. We did about four or five parks around Oxford and Ride were one of the bands that played. And they were hideously late and they all turned up in, Steve, the bass player's girlfriend's 2CV with all the gear in the back of the 2CV. And we're, they were good. I mean, you knew they were good then. Mm. Uh, and then a friend of mine, Mikey, started in front of house and I actually went along and did monitors for them. Um, right, okay. And I kind of stuck with them, well, till virtually the end of the career, really. Yeah, which is a, a fantastically exciting time for Oxford. I mean, that, I guess they were kind of, they're slightly just before... Radiohead and Supergrass when people really started looking at Oxford as an incredibly creative scene. But it's not too far into the future that that happened, really, is it? No, I mean, but before that, I was working for the first band I toured with from Oxford. It was a band called Play Dead, and they were pretty big nationally. Um, we went into TV. I went up to Newcastle to do a program called The Tube, which we're probably too young to remember. I sort of remember it, yeah. <laughs> I do remember it a bit, um, yeah. So I started off touring with, with Oxford bands. And that kind of started my my touring career, really. My first tour was was with Play Dead, um, who were half Oxford, half Banbury. And then I was in a band that was half Oxford, half Banbury as well. So there's kind of nice uh, symmetry there. Uh, we by now we actually went off as a uh, guitarist in the support band doing sound for the main band for a couple of tours. Right. So I had a playing career as well. 
Yeah, I was going to ask, I mean, before we kind of get a little too far into, you know, what happened in your career as, as, you know, a kind of sound engineer, what initially attracted you to that? And how did you actually get into the business of sound engineering rather than, I mean, you mentioned being in a support band? Um, well, I, I kind of, uh, I always, I always loved music. Um, I wanted to be in a band. Uh, I started off as a bass player, did a bit as a singer. I was a pretty bad singer, pretty bad bass player, and then took up guitar and uh, was in bands at school. But I was always the one sort of more interested in the technical side of things. So if anything went wrong, uh, I'd take it apart. I never had any technical knowledge of how to actually fix it, but uh, I'd always take the top off something and have a look. Uh, and then <laughs> I, I'd, when I was quite young, I was about 15 or 16, I actually went and did a, I went to a recording session at Abbey Road Studios uh, with my dad, um, whose friends of his were doing an album. And I, I sat in on that and it was, it was in the old days of Abbey Road. So it was the same studio the Beatles recorded in. And I didn't really understand how sort of iconic a building it was until many years later, really. But it really yeah. did sort of inspire me. So when I went to, you probably had careers advice at school. You know, you, yeah. you go in <laughs> a and little go, bit, yeah. and what do you want to be? And, you know, I went, uh, I would like to be a record producer or a sound engineer. And they're going, yeah, John, I don't think that's really a proper job. Uh, have you tried to thought about British Leyland? That's a good solid <laughs> job for life. Yeah. So, I'd, so I actually applied to the BBC to become a sound engineer, but didn't get in because I didn't have any of the qualifications. Oh, right. Okay. Um, which is, uh, you know, I never studied physics um, at school by some lack in the curriculum because I changed schools a couple of times. So I had biology and chemistry, but no physics. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, so I didn't get on into the BBC, but... I kind of kept up that side of being interested in the engineering. And I was always the one who would go to the mixing, you know, I ended up buying a mixing desk when I was about 17, 18, starting a little PA company uh, and just getting into that way, just learning by teaching myself, really. That's 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 fascinating to be self-taught in something like that. I mean, I was in bands, I was, well, I was in a band for a little bit and I was only the singer stroke shout only the so, you know, like, yeah <laughs> but, only the front but, man <laughs> yeah well i know but i mean in terms of my musical ability or my ability to actually tune a guitar or know how things were meant to be played i mean absolutely clueless and i was always sort of in awe of the people who did just sort of walk over and twiddle something or turn a knob or get a screwdriver out and suddenly it all sounded good again how long did that take you to kind of feel like you knew what you were doing about 40 years <laughs> um, I learnt just on the job and I must have been pretty awful really mm -hmm. to start with but I must have learnt quite quickly because I started getting a bit of work uh, and I kind of yeah I just kind of learnt just by doing really and just trial and error unfortunately a lot of people had to suffer my errors but I got some lucky breaks and I got to meet some really nice people early on uh, a couple of yeah. sort of there was a PA company in Reading called Scan Hire, and I, I did a couple of gigs with the boss, Pete Scan, who's kind of legendary in the business. And I learned a lot from him. And then I worked for a company in Oxford called Tiger Hire. And I pretty much learned most of the stuff I know off Jim, who was the boss of that company. It wasn't until years later I realized that he'd pretty much learned everything in the same way that I had <laughs> uh, by trial and error. But, yeah. uh, but, you know, we kind of, we got better and better together to a certain extent as things mm. grew, as we moved from sort of a transit van to a Luton transit van to a small truck, you know, mm. and it kind of progressed that way. Was there a point where you started to feel like, oh, this is actually a, a career? Was there a tour or a show or a moment or a signing on with a big band where you suddenly went, hmm, I think I might be in this for the long haul? I think it's, it was actually, do you know, it's, I hate to say it, it was Margaret Thatcher's fault. She introduced something called uh, Enterprise Allowance. And it was hard to get a job in those days. Uh, and this, they offered this thing, instead of having to sign on, you could get £50 a week to start up your own company. And I thought, well, I'll just start up a, a sound rental company. So I started up a little sound company uh, and that was it. Uh, it's, I've still got the company. It's still my main, you know, for many years, it was, you know, that was me, specialist sound hire. Wow, and I just kept uh, it going, and uh, and it was kind of that fifty pound a week. It's you didn't get any dole money; you just got fifty pound a week to help you out start this business, and it kind of started me out, and I'm still here. 
it's pretty rare that you find someone on this podcast. I think you'd say anything nice about Margaret Thatcher, but I know. Well, I haven't really got anything nice to say about it. But <laughs> you know, I thought it was it was actually a really good idea. I'm sure it wasn't her idea, um, mm. but a lot of people started off little little sort of uh, companies and businesses with that support, uh, and it was a good idea. And it kind of kept it it encouraged me to take it more seriously. Also, I was. Um, I was playing a lot. I was in a lot. I was working in bands a lot. Had a deal, but I was beginning to enjoy the sound engineering side of it a lot more. And then when the bands, when we got dropped by the record company, it was kind of I just thought I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to. I don't want to audition any more drummers. Yeah. Uh, or be in a band with anyone particularly. Uh, and I was getting better work as a sound engineer. So I was going out on tours as a sound engineer with, you know, hotels and money and then going out as a guitarist, sleeping in the van for nothing. And I thought, go one of these I'm enjoying. <laughs> so I, I just kind of stuck to being, I kind of went full into sound engineering. So who were these uh, early bands post-ride that you, you you were you were coming up with around that time? Like, uh, give us a kind of potted a pre-prodigy run. Pre, pre-prodigy, that is a lot pre-prodigy. I mean, uh, the bands I started, I'd, the first band I really started with was a band called Play Dead, uh, kind of a goth band. Um, and then the first kind of proper tour I got um, off my own back was probably Katrina and the Waves. Uh, oh, right. And wow. I went off as did monitors for Katrina and the Waves for a few years. Uh, before that, I was working with bands like the Railway Children, lots of sort of one-offs around Oxford, um, mm. working for Tiger Hire. But Katrina the Waves were the first band where I kind of got headhunted and offered a, a touring job, independent of the rec- of the the PA company. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of on. It was me as a freelance engineer, and that kind of that was good. It took me to America for the first time. Uh, took me around the world really, which was good. Did, uh, that was nice. Yeah. Oh yeah. Amazing. Lots of walking I mean, on sunshine. <laughs> I was going to say, do, did you get sick of hearing "Walking on Sunshine" every no, night? No, because it's a good tune. You know, it is it's, quite. A good it is tune, a good yeah, tune, and fair. everyone knows it. And they were really nice. You know, they're a really nice band. Uh, Katrina was lovely. Um, that they were just all really good fun to work with. Um, a bit older than myself as well, which probably helped. But it was, they were just really nice, and they took it all in a really nice way. You know, it wasn't too serious. And we did some quite big gigs. Um, and they were a very sort of settled set up. They had people, crew, many of the crew had been there for a long time. So it was uh, it was just nice to walk into a proper tour, really. I can't, I can't imagine what a Katrina and the Waves crowd looked like as well, to be honest. Students. I mean, we did lots of student gigs. Yeah. And a lot of Scandinavian gigs, really big in Scandinavia. So we would do, we did lots of Freshers Balls um, in the UK and then we went to uh, Scandinavia and did a lot of uh, open air festivals and a lot of gigs in, they do a lot of gigs in sort of theme parks. They've got places like Grinnelland and Liseborg where you'd, uh, you do the gig and it's, it's like their version of Alton Towers, but a bit older. And uh, it was great, great fun doing a gig and then going off on the roller coasters for free afterwards. Brilliant. That sounds brilliant. Yeah, it was fantastic. Early gig, early gig, yeah. have a couple of drinks, go on the roller coaster. That's it was great. They need to bring them back. Yeah. They need to get there. As soon, soon as lockdown ends, that's yeah, the first the reinvention coasters. I think needs to happen. <laughs> but yeah, I, I had good fun with Katrina. Um, and then that kind of led to other things. Uh, I did a lot of stuff. My brother was in a band as well. And I went off on tour with my brother's band a few times. So the band called the Candy Skins. Sort of one I of remember the, them. Yeah, they were kind of, uh, yeah. t- uh, it has to be said, Radiohead did hang on their coattails a bit. We used to have a we used to have a thing at this quite a famous gig in Oxford called the Jericho Tavern, mm. uh, and we used to have a interband karaoke type night where a band would come along and they'd have to play I think it was like two or three songs and they had to be cover versions, and uh, the audience kind of voted who would win, and it was generally considered you know well yeah they're the band that stole it. And you get bands like Supercross and Radiohead and the Candy Skins would get up and do their sort of couple of songs, all with the same back line, same guitar amps. And it was just down to sort of, you know, who did the best show. And Radiohead, I remember one year they rehearsed really hard and they, I think Tom did Rhinestone Cowboy. Everyone was going, they're, they're going to get it this year. You know, this, this is going to be the year. And then the Candy Skins came in and did uh, I Believe in Miracles Hot Chocolate and absolutely <laughs> just stole the show. <laughs> But it was quite an interesting place to to grow up 
around Oxford and to sort of my, learn my craft, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually sort of personally have very fond memories of Oxford from probably about a decade after this was going on. Um, they had a really good sort of alternative and rock and metal scene around that time and loads of great bands came through and I think Rage Against the Machine played the Zodiac the day Quite before possibly, they did yeah. the story. <laughs> I mean that they just did as a secret show it was it was you know really really exciting place to be and i always i do i did always feel a little bit jealous that i didn't get to see supergrass and radiohead playing in those kind of that area and those yeah. kind of club shows because i felt like it must have been super exciting well, I, I used to sh- i used to share a house with danny from supergrass uh because oh, right. I, I originally i started working when they were the jennifers which was the band before when his brother was still in the band and his brother went on to make the videos um and his brother moved into our flat. His brother's really nice, really quiet. And then he moved out and Danny moved in. And I was probably, I think Danny was about 17. And I think I was probably about 28 or 29. And he was just like, oh God, goodness, goodness gracious me. He was a chaotic <laughs> youth. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows Danny from Supercar, but he's like, <laughs> he's hilarious. But living with someone 10 years younger than you, who thinks that the ideal way to eat dinner is by throwing it up in the air and catching it in your mouth is just, it was just, it was quite funny. Uh, but I did yeah. move pretty soon afterwards. <laughs> Leave yeah. him to it. Get away. Get, Get away. away from them rock stars. So yeah, so I kind can. of, it's, yeah, it's, there was, everyone kind of knew everyone. Ox is so small that, you know, you only drank in one or one of two or three pubs. So you kind of, you know, everyone knew everyone, which is quite good. A bit incestuous, but quite good. What about uh, what happened to you after Katrina and the Waves? So Katrina and the Waves being the kind of, uh, I guess, the big international touring act. Where did you go after that? Uh, I went off and did um, a whole host of bands, really. Um, I went off and did bands like Gene. Um, I went off and did James, Boo Radleys. Uh, I ended up doing, in sort of the 90s, after Ride, because obviously I did Ride for quite a few years. I did Suede for a couple of years. So peak Britpop. Yeah. Oh, well, obviously, I did Radiohead for two years. Um, yeah. I did Pablo Honey and the Benz albums tours, doing monitors for them. And then I went off to do Suede, uh, and I did it up until Bernard left. Uh, and when that tour ended, I went back to Radiohead, thinking, oh, Suede are never going to come back again. Because Suede were um, sort of quite a, a, quite a big band at the time. Yeah. So I went off and did Suede and the Cranberries, uh, worked for the Cranberries briefly. Came back, uh, did Radiohead for a little while, and then after Radiohead, um, fell on to doing the Boo Radleys, the Do Radleys. Yeah, I mean, that list of names that you've just named is, is pretty much every, I mean, bar kind of Pulp, Blur and Oasis, you've pretty much named every big Britpop band from the yeah, era. Yeah, it was quite funny because I did Elastica as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, there's one and, I missed out. So you've done the, and you've obviously, got them, you? Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> I'd, just, I'd just been doing the Boo Radleys and the Boo Radleys tour manager was a guy, uh, Richard. Richard, the, the Boo Radleys tour manager, was Pulp's tour manager. And he asked right. me to come and do a show with them. So I went down and did monitors for them in Bristol, a Radio 1 show. And then while I was there, I went to my mum and dad were living in Bristol at the time and I got a phone call while I was at my mum and dad saying, uh, John, have you done front of house before? And I was going, yeah, I've done front of house. And I'd just been off with a band called Storm, who no one will have ever heard of. But uh, it was, they'd just done the Deep Purple support. And they said, uh, and Richard said, have you done any big gigs? And I said, well, I just did, I did Brixton and Birmingham NEC a couple of weeks ago. And he's going, so you've done big gigs? He said, yeah. He said, well, Matt, who's normally just front of House of Pulp, can't do the show tomorrow. And uh, Supergrass have pulled out of the Oasis support in Sheffield. And Pulp had been asked to do it. Can you do front of house? So I said, yes, obviously. <laughs> First rule, this is a first rule of any gig, always say yes. Um, I said yes, and I end up going up. Uh, so my first front of house gig was uh, Pulp Supporting Oasis at Sheffield Arena. Wow. And I end up doing, I end up meeting my wife that night as well. Um, really? Yeah, at the after show, well, during the dressing room in the daytime, and then at the after show party afterwards, uh, we met. Uh, and it wasn't until the next day I found out it was the guitarist's sister. So working with a brand new band, uh, managed to get off with a guitarist sister f- second day. So, 
I never knew if that boded well or was a good idea or a bad idea. But, <laughs> oh, the 90s. But we're still together, so, that, you know, that was, well, a, good, yeah, that was a good thing. Well, yeah, absolutely. It's obviously, you know, um, it, it, well, that seems to have worked out well. Uh, how exciting was that time, That was think? great. I remember going down t- uh, with my wife, Rachel, down to um, Townhouse in London uh, and listening in. And they were just finishing off Different Class, the album. Yeah. And we'd kind of heard a few bits and pieces. Uh, and I remember the first time I heard Common People thinking, oh, that's, that's a good tune. <laughs> it, was, it was Sorted for Reason Wiz, actually, was the one that I really, really impressed me. That's a great song. Um, but then Matt, their former engineer, was uh, the engineer for Blur. So Blur were obviously doing quite a lot. So he couldn't do the show. So I stepped in as front of house engineer for about, about a year, uh, I think from sort of May until Christmas that year. So the whole of 95, I spent working for Pulp. So I did Leeds Round Hay Park, I think was my second gig. Then a really big festival, I think Pink Pop or something like that. That was my third gig. And then my fourth gig was Glastonbury, Saturday night headline stage. That which is still Yeah, there. which is still one of my favourite ever gigs. Yeah. And I learned something really important at that gig is that don't go to front of house in just a t-shirt uh, because you'll get stuck there and you'll be really, really cold by the time the band come on. And I was right. by the end of that show, I was absolutely freezing. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a yeah, it's in my top ten gigs of all time. It was such really? a Jarvis was such a good front man. Well, he still is a good front man. Uh, and they were just really on form, and they captured the moment of the time. You know, everyone in that field just thought, "Yeah, this is saying what we want to hear. This is this is capturing the moment." I mean, it, it was a time where I mean, I was sort of fifteen, sixteen when all this was happening, so I don't really feel like I knew any better to go. Oh, you know, these sort of weird, interesting <laughs> alternative bands are selling millions and millions of records. I guess that's just what happens all the time, but. You no. having kind of <laughs> come from the underground of the Oxford scene and known, you know, and play, seen these bands in pubs and stuff. I mean, the whole thing that people talk about with Britpop is that it was this cultural phenomenon which totally captured this joyous moment in in British history. Was that is that fair to say? Like looking back on it, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a difficult one, really. I mean, I just saw it as it was quite good to be working for loads of British bands who were doing quite well. Um, yeah. And bands that were doing okay in America as well. Um, strangely enough, the bands that they thought were going to do well, I remember going over to the States to do this. Sort of, they do a music conference and a couple of bands went over and I went over with Echo Valley, which is actually the, the band of my former, the bass player of my former band. And everyone, they were the tip for the top. And uh, we bumped into Oasis out there, who obviously did slightly better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it was a difficult, it was, it was good fun, but it was kind of, it was very sort of stuck in, you know, it was a British thing. It, yeah, I don't it was, think yeah. it really transferred abroad that much. You know, not many of these bands, we did, Pulp always did well in France. I remember touring France and they, they would, they always did well in France, which was good. Yeah. I mean, my girlfriend's American and she hasn't heard of any of these bands. Other yeah. Than sort of a Blur and Oasis. She knows Wonderwall and a few Blur songs. And it seems like the rest of it just never, ever translated no. at all. I mean, I suppose Radiohead, obviously, you know, I saw Radiohead at Madison Square Garden. So they've done it. It took right, Radiohead but... a long time to break America. I mean, the first yeah. couple of times we went there, it was not very well received, not particularly good. The interesting thing is I did the Suede Cranberries tour where Suede was seen as going to be the the sort of, uh, you know, they definitely thought they were the headlining band. And it was actually a dual headline and the band swapped every other gig. Um, and Cranberries just nailed it. They just went down a storm and, you know, really just sort of, you know, you can't imagine the Cranberries blowing Suede off stage, but it was in the sort of audience response. That's definitely what was happening. You can never tell in America really what's going to catch on. It's such a, it's such a weird place to tour. Yeah, it, I mean, I, I've heard stories of Radiohead before OK Computer coming out, touring with Alanis Morissette and doing like 15 minute long versions of Paranoid Android that no one's heard yet. And you just think, well, I'm not really surprised that <laughs> a, little, a little while before, you know, um, people, I, yeah, I feel they've, like they've a lot right, of those British they? bands went over with a sort of, well, you, you have, everybody likes us in England, so you're, you're yeah. going to like this as well, no matter what. I don't think that's, you know, that's never... I think Tom just writes stuff that he likes. 
Tom and Johnny, you know, they write stuff they like and it's not really bothered if anyone else likes it. Uh, it's just lucky that they do. But we did, you know, we did well in Australia, did a great show in Hong Kong one time. Um, strange enough, Thailand was really good. It was one of, probably one of the first really big gigs I did with them. Uh, so they, you know, they we got around the world on. I think it was the Benz probably was sort of the the first big sort of international album for them. Mm. Uh, That's one of my ten favorite albums ever. Yeah, I mean, I, it's my I, favorite I, radio album. It's I brilliant. parted company with them after that. To, after that, after a fractious Mexican tour. But yeah, I mean, it's they've got some tunes, haven't they? Oh, I think Johnny's. Band. I think Johnny's totally genius. I must admit, I'm, I'm a big yeah. fan of Johnny Greenwood. I think they're, they're an absolutely incredible band. I mean, I was about to ask you, you know, obviously you've mentioned a lot of big bands and there's a lot of big names to talk about, people like Jarvis Cocker or Brett Anderson, you know, and Dolores from the Cranberries. Did you envisage that jump from Pablo Honey to the Benz? I think that's a phenomenal expansion of their sound between those two records. Um, I don't know, really, because it's not as... if you're in, If you're on tour with them it's not usually such a big jump because you've usually heard bits because all bands rehearse in sound checks and you hear you hear bits coming out and uh, you kind of know what's coming before the general general public do because they'll rehearse songs in sound checks before going into the studio every now and again. I think more in the past when, when less stuff was documented, bands would actually try songs out live a lot more. Now because yeah. of uh, the internet, there's a risk that if you try anything new, it's going to be all over the whole world. Whereas before, you know, you'd you could be, you could play a new a brand new song to an audience in Ohio, and no one in the rest of the world would ever hear it. You could yeah. just try it out. So I think that's made for for a less adventurous world in that way, because bands used to kind of tour to to routine and try out albums. It was yeah. a way of seeing what goes down well. Um, but I heard, definitely heard you know a lot of songs before before the rest of the world did. So I kind of knew it was coming. Uh, and it's always exciting watching bands work, really, watching that side of things. Mm. Uh, the only band that ever sort of surprised me that was, I mean, I still never know what the next Prodigy album was going to sound like because Liam would keep it all to himself. And you'd hear, yeah. you'd think, oh, I think I know what it's going to sound like because he'd played lots of bits in between and then none of it would be on the Rex record. <laughs> uh, so he always caught me by surprise, really. Well, let's um let's talk about the prodigy then. So, what? How did you first, and when did you first get involved with with the prodigy? Well, the story actually goes back a long time. Uh, it's kind of a couple of stories. I, the tour manager, a guy called John Fares, was actually the. He won't mind me saying this. He was the most useless roadie for the support band for a guy called Andy Pollack, who supported Katrina and the Waves back in the early days. Right. And John okay. was 17 and he came along with his mate Andy, who was a singer. He was pretty good. And John, I'd like to say, set everything up. He kind of emptied the van, put the stuff on stage and we used to have to set, help him every day. Uh, he was absolutely useless, but a, a very personable, nice fella. Fast forward sort of 20 years and uh, I'd actually got a call. I was on tour doing, I was doing a band called Blue, um, the boy band, uh, covering for a friend of mine and um, the front of our engine. I was doing monitors covering from a guy called Matt Napier. And the front of our guy was an old friend of mine called Nick Warren, who was the prodigy's front of our engineer. And we had a fantastic time. Well, the tour was actually, it was two weeks in Japan and we only did four gigs with a week off in the middle. So it was, oh. yeah. See, it took me a lot of convincing to get me to agree to do that tour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And me and Nick had a brilliant time. And he was doing, he was doing fun about, I knew him from Paul, from, sorry, from Prodigy. And he, he phoned me up and said, uh, Keith Flint's got a gig with his sort of offshoot band, which is a band called Clever Brains Frying. Can you do it? I can't do it. I'm away doing, um, I, can't, I can't remember what he's doing, some pop thing. And I said, yeah. And then I turned up and the tour manager was John, who went, I know you. <laughs> and we kind of said hello for the first time in 20 years. Uh, the gig went really well and uh, got on well with Flinty. We had quite a laugh. It was a Versace uh, fashion show in Milan. Keith right. was Keith was just ran about like a lunatic. Um, yeah, managed to cut his cut himself open and get blood everywhere, which was <laughs> it was just chaotic, you know. And it was like 
it was just quite a fun weekend away. Didn't think anything of it. And then uh, we were waiting for the, everyone was waiting for the Prodigy album. It was um, always outnumbered, never outgunned, which was quite a few years after the, the previous one. Everyone had been waiting for a long time. And Nick just said, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to come back. I don't want to leave what I'm doing to come do a Prodigy tour. Um, so he put me up for the job. Joe, the monitor engineer, put someone else up for the job. They started the job and then said, I, I don't want to do it. Um, so I kind of stepped into their shoes. So I got it second second hand like that, just like the kind of s- sort of uh, slightly random way that most you get most jobs, really, because you know someone and you're, you're in the right place at the right time. I can't imagine who wouldn't want to be on tour with the Prodigy. That seems insane to me. <laughs> well, it's not... It's not the gig you think it is. <laughs> okay. It's quite hard work and it doesn't suit some people. Uh, because if you're very particular about, if you're a bit of a control freak, it's not for you because Liam's a control freak and he's in charge and it's very loud. And if you don't like loud music and it's it's the hardest easy gig I know. Right, okay. And I think that's the best way and I've seen lots of people, you know, a few, quite a few people have tried it and I, they still kept coming back to me. So I don't know what I was doing right, but but it's it's not as easy as people make out. Someone actually said to me, well, someone didn't say it to me. They said it of me. I said, oh, well, he's not a very good engineer because he just does a band that's a DJ, a DJ and a couple, <laughs> of, a couple of singers. Right. Which to a certain extent it is, you know, it's it was a DJ, but it's also a drummer and there's a guitarist who also plays bass. And there's two singers, one of them who's got a really quiet voice and one of them's got a voice like a foghorn. Mm. Uh, and it's really, really loud on stage. And you've got to try yeah. and make sense of that for the audience and make it a good experience for the audience. So, it, you know, I'd never say it was, no gig is easy. You know, I don't think there's no band that I've ever worked for. Some are easier than others. If the band yeah. essentially sound great, you just have to push the faders up. Yeah. Uh, but... It's, it's, you know, it was always hard work doing a prodigy show. I was going to ask you actually um, regarding that about how hard it was to, I mean, you've sort of answered it already, but I was going to say how hard it was to make sure the prodigy, who are a band with a, a ferocious reputation as a live band. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, I've seen them at least 10, 12 times over the last couple of decades. I've never seen them be anything short of magnificent. I can't imagine them having an off night ever. Did they ever have an off night? Not really, no. <laughs> They're all just pretty consistent. You know, the person who keeps together, you know, Liam's Liam. and But Maxim, just, he kept the show going every time. Keith could have flaky nights. Um, but he was always, he'd always put everything into it. They both, they'd all always put 100% into it. You know, they came to do a show, they'd do a show, and everyone knew they'd done the show. It was always, you know, it's a roller coaster, you know, there's no stopping it. Once you, once they start, that's it. It's, you've got a full on show at full speed. What was it like when they, because I mean, I suppose always that number never outgunned when you first started working with them, was sort of seeing, I don't think it's now looked about, looked at as a, a disappointing record, but I think at the time people were like, ah, it's not quite as good as the fat of the land. And then you did see, a little bit of weirdness and a bit of a dip in their in their profile a bit. I think I think they were still obviously doing incredible live shows, but their profile dipped a little bit. But then when Invaders Must Die came out, yeah, I mean that, that they really, got that second win, didn't they? Yeah, and the the weird thing was that they they got a whole new generation of audience because uh, when I started doing Always Outnumbered, it was mainly the older sort of raver types coming along, uh, and then when Invaders came along. They got this whole new younger audience and they also kind of reinvented themselves as a metal band. I remember we did Download Festival on the second stage. And, I was going to ask you about this. Yeah. And uh, I remember on the website, someone had posted up, what's the world come to when a couple of DJs are headlining a rock festival? And someone underneath had, had written down, said, at least they're a proper band, not like the band on the main stage, which was Guns N' Roses who has been, <laughs> and it was quite interesting that they do, you know, they kind of cross so many, we did so many different festivals. We could do a goth festival, we could do a dance festival, we could do a techno festival, we could do a heavy metal festival yeah. because they gave a bit of that to everyone. But it was interesting seeing 
kids turning up with their parents and, you know, such a wide age group uh, from, you know, from youngsters up to sort of 60 year olds, really. There were ravers of 65, 70 year olds coming along. Uh, it was quite funny. You could always tell sort of the overexcited middle-aged people who all got a bit overexcited and thought they were still 25 again. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm getting to that point, to be fair. But I was going to ask you about that download show, actually, since you mentioned it. I mean, it's kind of gone down in folklore as one of the best ever performances at that festival. Um, I was speaking to Andy Coppin, who books the festival. Yeah. And he said he could see this like stream of people the second the prodigy finished streaming out to run down and watch guns and roses and they all looked like they'd been they were <laughs> sweating and covered in mud it was really hot exhausted it, yeah so it was like it, it was like a house fire in there and it was really dusty really really dusty yeah. so there were just great big clouds of dust and not many people could get in it wasn't a very big stage i think it was still in a, it was in a tent that year and it was just ut- utterly rammed. And there were so many people that all, loads of more people came along just to find out what was going on. Yeah. And then there was, the, yeah, there was a bit of an exodus to Guns N' Roses uh, and then a bit of an exodus not long afterwards when people kind of left really Guns N' Roses. Guns Roses well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, amazing. I mean, that for me is the moment, you, you kind of touched on it when they say they reinvented themselves as a metal band. I think anyone who had any doubts, I mean, I think those, for me, those doubts of them yeah. being, you know. I mean, I think when Rob joined, uh, it probably had a bigger impact than most people realise because he really just took the sort of guitar part and took it by the scuff of its neck and just sort of made it his own. And he was such a strong, you know, forceful personality on stage as so well. Gave a real foil for Keith to sort of, yeah. sort of Keith to mess around with. Yeah, yeah, that's um, true. And there was, you know, it was a, it was a good show. You always got value for money. Lots of lights, lots of sound, lots of shouting, a bit of swearing. And, and a, a very different show uh, every time as well, I think. I mean, I saw them, I saw them on Invaders Must Die, I saw them on Day Is My Enemy. Um, I didn't get to see them on No Taurus, uh, unfortunately. You missed the buses, um, you missed the double-decker buses. How surprising was it for you? Just as, you know, How much input did you have into the kind of overall feel of the, or, or, or how was that designed as a show? Because I always felt like I never knew what I was going to get when I went to see a Prodigy show. I just, I didn't get involved in the, the lighting design was whoever the lighting designer was at the time, but the band always had fairly, oh, I'd like to say they had fairly specific ideas. They knew what they didn't want more than they knew what they wanted a lot of the time. But they came up with some, the actual, the no tourists actually, it was a, it was a little tiny dinky bus actually, it was the one that was taken for the cover. Liam said, yeah, I think I have a couple of buses on stage. It was a bit like the Milton Keynes thing where he said, yeah, let's get some ambulances. So we ended up with four ambulances uh, flying in the sky, which is quite funny, with giant strobes. Yeah. It's pretty much, I think that I thought the best design, one of my favourites was the uh, the Their Law Tour, the Greatest Hits Tour we did, just after um, the All's Outnumbered. I think that's the tour that, that brought them back because they played so many of the old songs plus some of the new songs. But people realised how good they were again. And the word got out, you know, this is a, you know, they're back. It's a proper show. And that kind of went into, because we kind of toured the greatest hits for quite a while. And that kind of went almost into the next tour, that, you know, that, to Invaders. Yeah, they were on unbelievable form every time I ever saw them. Um, I didn't get to go. I was going to ask you about the Milton Keynes show because, um, you know, I didn't actually go to that show. But seeing it, it was like, oh, this is kind of a coronation, like a re-coronation of this Yeah, it's probably... This band. S- if I have to say one show I'm most proud of in my career, it's probably got to be that one, just because we put so much effort into it. Um, it was, you know, I, I worked really hard on the sound design because when you do when you do a festival, you don't get to decide where the speakers go. You don't get to control the system. You, it's up to someone else and you just go along and mix. This one, I worked really closely with Sid Rogerson, who'd worked with me for many years on Prodigy. And we just, we had, we didn't have an unlimited budget, but... We knew we could do a good job. And I think we came up with a design that had sort of four, over 400 bass drivers. Um, and I think everyone had a reason, you know, I thought it was a good sound everywhere. I hope it was a good sound for everybody. Mm. And a, a sound that, you know, I'm a big fan of democracy of sound. I want everyone in the audience to have the same experience. Yeah. I don't really care what it sounds like where I am, as long as it sounds good everywhere else. 
Uh, yeah. And when the bass drops, I want everybody in the audience to go, ooh, what was yeah. that? You know, I don't want half yeah. the audience going, oh, that's amazing. The other half go, why, what happened? I want everyone to get the same experience. Mm. Uh, and I think I think Milton Keynes, we, we did a good job, I think, even mm. down to taking the local council to court. We took the local council to court because uh, they they were trying to make out it was a kind of, the noise levels were based on the fact it was a park, which I don't know if anyone's been to Milton Keynes Bowl, but it's not a park. It's It's a car park more than a park. It's a round bowl with a car park in the middle that's used for yeah. boot fairs. It's got a big, you know, mound around it, and they were saying it had to be a certain level. And we actually took took the council to court and got it reclassified as an open air venue, which meant that we could get a reasonable volume inside the bowl for the audience. Mm. We started to be careful outside, but I think inside it was it was a good level. It was loud enough that that, that we had the noise police guy was next to me. And he had his laptop on a flight case and the laptop was vibrating so much because the bass is actually computer died. And he, couldn't, <laughs> he didn't know I was too loud, <laughs> which was quite a good, great. good experience. It's quite difficult to get. I mean, how, how much of a challenge is it to get the sound right in various different venues? Because it's I hugely mean- difficult. I've spent kind of the last 20 years really working on my knowledge of sound systems and the way on acoustics and, and what you can and can't do and looking at investigating bass frequencies and how I can get the same sound for everyone. And it comes down to physics, really. You have to design the system properly. And it, it annoys me when systems are badly designed. Uh, it's not, you know, when you go to a festival, it's it's partially the sound engineer's fault if it sounds rubbish, but it's more than often not the whoever's put the system together. Uh, and how they've arranged their system, where they put the speakers, how much money they've spent on speakers. Have they put enough for the amount of audience they're covering? And a lot of the time, you know, it's it's not just simply down to the sound engineer. And also the fact that at a festival, you can only be the sound engineer for one spot uh, in the middle in that strange tower. And it's very difficult to know what it sounds like six foot outside that tent because you don't get a chance to go out. Yeah, well, that's something that I've ex- definitely experienced over the years. Is whether it be wind or you know, yeah, I mean, of... wind is wind is is probably the worst. Um, yeah, just temperature in general, uh, it affects sound so much. It's not the wind blowing the sound away; it's a temperature inversion that makes the treble go up. So the treble just disappears. Um, so you get that kind of whooshing sound where you can't hear the words properly. Must be deeply frustrating. I know as a fan, kind of standing at the back of a festival field and thinking i don't really know yeah well, what this is weird. i did an article quite a while ago where it's about fest sound at festivals for sound on sound magazine and i talked to loads of engineers and i think it was um ray furs who was uh, used to do he did the spice girls was the last thing he did just said well you need a you need a great band to have a great festival you need a great band you need to play really well you need a good sound system a good engineer and good weather <laughs> and you need all these things, you yeah. know, and good weather is as important as, as the good engineer. Weather at festivals, don't get me started on weather at festivals. <laughs> I, have a, I have a reputation for going mad if it rains at well, festivals. Well, so. I've had, you know, we've had everything. That's, I remember doing tea in the park and it was uh, the year that it was, the people were getting sunstroke on the Friday and frostbite on the Sunday. <laughs> people Gosh. actually had hypothermia on the Sunday because the weather changed so much. So well, I don't, if you go to a festival in Scotland, you're mad, aren't you? Oh, Surely, it's, yeah. It's, I've, I've done tea in the park so many times. Loch Ness was the the it's Rock Ness where you just get bitten by midges continually. Right. <laughs> but I, I love festivals. Uh, it's the one thing that I miss the most. But uh, they'll be back. You know, we'll all be back. Yeah. May not not this year, but hopefully, hopefully next year. So, um, in the kind of interim of uh, when Prodigy were on downtime, you worked with. Pendulum, Stereophonics, uh, any other kind of big highlights from, from that period? Yeah, I did Stereophonics for a couple of years. Uh, Pendulum f- did the first year with them. Uh, Stereo MCs. Yep. Uh, Brian Ferry for about, on and off for about 10 years. Did one a couple of shows. Did Bjork, Bats for Lashes. Um, anyone, really. I work for anyone. I've uh, mm. just been doing, I did Gabrielle for a little while. Yeah, it's, I'm a jobbing engineer. The one thing is I've always done is I've always said yes to 
pretty much any project because you never know what's going to be good fun. I mean, yeah. going back to that blue thing, that was a great, you know, I got, I was kind of really doubting whether I should do it, you know, pop band, me, pop band. Mm. But it was great fun. And and I had a really good time. And they were actually really, really nice to work with. And I ended up going out and doing, doing them again uh, for another tour. And that, again, was a really good fun tour because you never know what's going to, because it's the people that's important. Yeah. The music, you're going to get fed up with it, whatever it is. Uh, and in some ways, the worst thing to do is go off and work for your favourite ever band because you're only ever going to be disappointed. Yeah. I think. Um, I wasn't a big Prodigy fan when I started working for them. You know, I knew the big singles, but I didn't I didn't have any Prodigy albums. I'd seen them a couple of times. I actually toured with them. I did. I was working for Tricky and we did Lollapalooza uh, and Prodigy came along for sort of about a third of that tour. Oh. And I remember just thinking, God, that's that's loud. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I didn't really pay that much attention to them until I started working for them. And then you have to, then I go out and as soon as I start working for a band, I go and learn all the songs. I go and listen to every single album on rotation over and over and over again. Uh, I did, I've done things that, I, yeah, I did Mika. I've learned oh, yeah, everything. I, I learned to the whole Mika first album. And yeah. Then, I will never get those songs out of my head. They're catchy. Catchy, yeah, so lollipop, catchy. lollipop. It's oh, I shudder thinking of it. Um, <laughs> but I had some good times, you know. Work with lots of nice people. You know, the great thing about this is you work with people who are doing something they enjoy, which is music. Uh, so you've got. It's not like a normal job. Uh, you know, I look forward to work every day. It's kind of kept me going for the, for many years. But it's the love of music really that keeps you going. Well, to kind of move it on to. I guess where we started up, which is you talking about you um, deciding to get a proper job and how that decision was partially influenced by what happened with uh, yeah. with Keith. Um, obviously, I don't want to I don't want to pry too much into it and tell me to shut up and mind my own business if if you want to. But um, when that news came about, how much of a shock was that to you? It was a huge shock. Yeah, I I, I, I got a phone call from a mate who said. Um, I was actually on the way to the guitar tech's house and I got a mate call from the other guitar, the previous guitar tech saying, have you heard about Keith? And I was going, no. And then within five minutes, I was just getting text after text after text. Um, he always had his demons, you know, he'd struggled with depression quite a few times, but we'd done a tour in New Zealand. Uh, we last shows were in New Zealand and he'd been in a really good mood. So, I think retrospectively, you're never that surprised. But at the time, I was quite shocked. Um, and I kind of panicked, really. I was, because um, your whole world, we, we, we were supposed to be on tour a couple of weeks later. I'd just um, exchanged contracts on a house. Uh, so the financial implications were hideous. But that's, you know, it was, you, you it, drew to an end um, a whole part of my career, 15 years. 15 years is an awfully long time to work for a band. Uh, and, you know, I haven't really spoken to the band since then because, um, you know, I'll speak to them when we got something, when something else happens, when something, yeah, something good will come out of it. But it's been a, it was quite a shock. And I've been thinking about retiring or certainly topping touring and getting more into education because I'd gone back to, I never went to university. I just went straight into rock and roll. I went and worked in a music shop when I left school mm. uh, and played in bands. Uh, so I never went to university. So I thought I'd, I'll go and, but I'd done lots of guest lecturing uh, at different universities around the country. And I'd done several courses in different places. <clears throat> I'd just been out to uh, Serbia to teach out there and done a course in Armenia as well. And I thought I'd always been planning to kind of, go into education. So I went to York and did a master's degree part-time, uh, which I did on a Prodigy tour. Um, and I investigated the effect of sub-bass uh, using the Prodigy sound system, <laughs> uh, which we also did. All my testing was done at, uh, I think, Wembley. Nice. Wembley Arena. So it's kind of, I think it makes it look a bit cooler. Um, so yeah. I was kind of interested because I was interested in, and that was to do with uh, trying to get the best experience for audience members um, so they'd have a really good experience by, by using low frequency noise. So I kind of did that academic side. And then as soon as it happened, I just felt I, I'm never going to get a band of that caliber. 
you know, that I've kind of reached the pinnacle of my career. I'm just going to get a job and pay the mortgage. Uh, so I, I applied to various universities, got a couple, offered a couple of jobs and ended up at Derby, which was kind of, I felt was the best fit for my skills really. Cause it's a mm. degree where I'm teaching sound. Uh, I teach bits, mainly sound, a bit of lights, but it's a proper science based degree. And I can get a bit to a bit of research as well. And I've just finished my first year there. It's quite uh, it, it, considering you were um, shunned by the BBC for yes, your lack know. of uh, kind of education. It seems quite a you know quite a nice well, end yeah. to the story that you've managed to, it's uh, funny to, I'm, to find yeah. your way as a professor. Well, I'm now teaching physics at master's level when I don't even have a GCSE in it. That's amazing. Which is quite. I, I'm sure my science teachers at school would find that quite ironic. I think yeah. most of my teachers at school would be find it quite ironic that I'm a university lecturer. But it was kind of <laughs> kind of a natural progression for me. I'd been kind of headed that way for quite some time. And I've been I've been interested in mainly from my experiences, the lack of education when I was young. I'd always been interested in trying to sort of uh mentor people and educate people into to my profession really. Mm. Uh and that's what I'm that's what I'm doing now, but I'm doing it from the inside now rather than the outside. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, my my best friend's a teacher, and he says I get such a a lot of excitement from actually passing knowledge on and seeing these people grow into something yeah. that they uh, and taking that knowledge with them. I mean, I, I suppose that is obviously quite a big. I think it's the main the job, reason you do it? it. It's the mentoring side. I think it's the reason I do it, and the fact that mm. when you can push people, and you know, you can nudge them in the right direction, and you see they they do, you know, they're successful. Uh, it's just a really good feeling. It's you know, it's obviously got frustrations, but but generally, I, I I'm really enjoying teaching. Luckily, I've still got a few gigs. Well, I did have a few gigs as well. Yeah, uh, enough to keep my hand in. I'm doing a bit of. Uh, I've always had a studio, so I'm keeping a bit of mixing going. Just been working for a, a Russian band mixing their album, and hoping to get to you know, I, I just, like I said, I had some really nice gigs this summer to do, but just enough to keep me occupied in some nice places but that's obviously out the window now but we'll have to see what comes up next year well i mean i'll just to end up i know we kind of we went on to it but just to kind of end up on keith really really quickly um i think he's one of the most recognizable and important figures in music from the generation that i grew up in i think he is a genuinely iconic person uh, when you see that fire starter video Everybody from my generation knew exactly what that was. What What is he to you? Like when you think back over the years of working with him, rather than, because obviously I just know him as the kind of weird guy with the, the hair and stuff, but <laughs> if, you if know, you, I, I'm sure he's more than that. If you ever met Keith, um, everyone was always surprised because he was always the most polite, <laughs> just really nicely spoken, uh, just and totally charming and not at all, you know, People forget the the kind of stage thing was to a certain extent a persona. Yeah. Uh, it's just we'd he would always call me Mister Burton, <laughs> and uh, just a bit. I t- I've I haven't got a bad word to say against Keith. Really, he was he was a really nice bloke to work for. Um, couldn't remember the words most of the time, but just always <laughs> gave it all and just threw himself about the stage like a lunatic. Mm. But I think the. It, the, the important thing about the prodigy was that Maxim glued it all together as well, you know. Yeah. And people, he doesn't get the praise that that he deserves, but you know, it's all Liam, you know. Prodigy's yeah. Liam, but Keith was uh, just a, such a brilliant front man because he could just he, him and him and Maxim ruled the stage, you know. They'd always be working. They'd if they were on the stage, they were doing something, you know, and they would just be. I mean, the thing is, but you can't really ask me because I never looked up. But too, way too many strobes, and I just kept my head down and listened to the music. That was what I did. Yeah. I avoided strobes for fifteen years. Kept my head down. <laughs> <laughs> got to the end of the gig, and hopefully it sounded all right. Yeah, people would say, "Like, did you see what Keith did tonight?" And I'm going, "No." <laughs> and to the point where, um, if it was ever a festival that had a sort of a rat run to front of house, like a the gap in the barrier. I remember I was mixing and all of a sudden I felt the mixing desk start to tip away from me because it's on a, a 
we use these things called tippers, which makes it easier to set up. And if you put too much weight on the other end, the other side from where I'm standing, it'll tip back over again. All of a sudden, this big desk, and I had a big analog desk, it started tipping over. And I looked up and Keith is standing on the corner of it. And he's made his way from the stage all the way to the front of the house. And he's just standing on the corner of my desk. So I <laughs> not realise it's all about to tip over and the whole show is about to end. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd also come out and he'd come and hug me, which is nice. But Keith used to sweat an awful amount. Yeah. So it's a bit like, you know, that, that slightly damp feeling that's quite warm and then gets cold really quickly mm. and goes from quite pleasant to really unpleasant in not, not a very long amount of time. But yeah. he'd, he'd come up and do weird, funny stuff like that. It was always, you know, you never knew it was going to happen. And that was, that was the excitement and that was the fun. But yeah. he always put in 100%. They're a great band. And I mean, I don't know if they'll come back. And I don't know if you'd want them to come back and if you would work with them again if they were to come back. But uh, and I don't know how that would look. Um, Liam will do something. Don't know what he'll do, but he's not going to stop. And I hope I hope he's got the rest with him. But yeah, if you if you're looking for when's it going to happen, I don't know. Sorry. No. Would, would <laughs> you jump back in if if, yeah, if that were to happen? Of course I would. It was okay. a lot of my life, you know. It's 15 years is a long time. Mm. In the same way, that, you know, I'd like to think I'd work with any artist that I worked with before, because he shared so many good times with people, not just the artists but the crew associated with them as well. Yeah, you know, a lot of these people that. They were still good friends that I still see and talk to on a regular basis. So it's part of a community, really. Yeah, of course. Well, to kind of close up, as we always do, um, I'm going to ask you, John, your best and worst day on the job ever. Uh, the best day on the job ever? Oh, it's a difficult one, really. Probably it'll either be Milton Keynes or Pulp at Glastonbury. Probably Milton Keynes because I put because it was such a, a group effort that I felt I contributed to. Everything was you know everything came together that day really nicely. Worst ever, that's easy. So, right, okay. So uh, I was working for the band called The Damned, and I managed to. Uh, I, I think I just came down with like cold or flu, and the night before, and we we were going down. We were in the middle of a tour. And I missed the loadout because I was feeling so dreadful. And I'd had various run-ins with the drummer during the tour, Mr. Rat Scabies, uh, yeah. who's, a, I think, it, most people would describe him as difficult. It's a slightly difficult person to work with. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I'd managed to get, I was feeling really dreadful. I missed the loadout because I just had to go to bed. And I woke up outside uh, the Forum in London for two nights at the Forum and I was late for loading because I was still in bed and I just couldn't get up and I managed to drag myself up, went in, didn't want anything to eat, finished the sound check uh, and I just felt absolutely dreadful. But some friends had come down and we went to the Chinese restaurant across the road. I had chicken and cashew nuts and snapped my wisdom tooth in half. Oh. So I had a snapped wisdom tooth, flu, and then we, we were doing two nights and I knew I had to do a second night there. And they were too tight to pay for a hotel. So we were sleeping on this cold bus. And I thought, bugger it, I'm going to go home. So I got the bus back to Oxford and then realised, as soon as I got on the bus, I realised I'd forgotten my front door keys. Oh. So I then spent frantically trying to find out my flatmate to see if she'd let me in when I got there. So I was faced with the prospect of getting all the way back to Oxford and not being able to get in my house and having to come all the way back to London again. I explained to her I'd left my keys behind. So she let me in. Uh, and then she went off to work in the morning. I overslept in the morning and she thought I'd left my keys in Oxford, not London. So she'd locked the front door. So I spent, spent half an hour breaking out of my house uh, <laughs> by climbing over the next door's garden, over three gardens to get out of the end of the terrace. Uh, got back to London just late for the sound check. And it was just, I still had flu, still had a s snapped wisdom tooth and just felt dreadful. Uh, but we actually had quite a good gig. And at the end of the tour, Scabies came up to me with a bottle of whiskey and a T-shirt and said, there you are, lad. Good good job. Another couple of weeks, you'd have got the hang of it. And I thought... <laughs> that's, that's something from a Ben Stiller film. Yeah, it was that, but that was that's the like, worst 24 hours. It was, yeah. Absolute comedy of errors. Well, um, 
John, thanks for coming on the show. It's a pleasure, really, mate. really Absolute appreciate pleasure. it. It's been lovely chatting to you. And um, yeah, I hope everything goes back to um, normal soon so you get to do Yeah, it'd be nice to do some gigs uh, soon. I yeah, hope it goes do. back for yeah, everyone, soon. you know, I hope, and I hope it all recovers as, as quickly as it possibly can. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks for chatting to us, mate, and um, we, we appreciate your time. See you soon. No problem. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right, yeah, there you go. That was John. What a lovely man. A really interesting story. And um, I think you can feel the kind of the warmth radiate from John when we spoke about the prodigy and what it was like working with those guys and particularly what it was like working with Keith. Uh, a, a fitting tribute to a fantastic live band and what would appear to be, you know, a, a truly lovely, lovely man. And just a great life story as well. Um, John's really made, you know, the fact that he said he couldn't get a job at the BBC due to his lack of education. He's ended up teaching people. I mean, that's the kind of the beauty of live music, that great kind of leveler, isn't it? You just get stuck in and, you know, suddenly one day, just from a sort of passion for listening to music, you end up being um, an integral part of the fabric of of making those great gigs happen. So that's exactly what we want to be showing here on the podcast and yeah and so we'll be back next week with another great guest a really great guest can't tell you it is at the moment just in case it all falls through but i think we're going to have something pretty pretty special coming up next week so make sure you are subscribed make sure you're following us on our social media pages at road crew pod find us on instagram find us on facebook um, and a big thank you to our friends at signature brew for basically getting me drunk while i'm sitting at home with very very little to do go over to signaturebrew.co.uk and get 10 percent off uh, all of your beer orders uh, when you put in the code road crew in the in the checkout and yeah i can confirm after extensive research, that their drinks are very, very lovely indeed. Uh, We'll be back next week, as I said, with a top guest again. Thanks for listening, and we will see you very, very soon.